Hare Krishna. Going to thank you very much for joining today. Hare Krishna. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Yes. So, Prabhu, I thought today we could discuss broadly about education. And in there are multiple things, the principles of education and the forms of education. So, specifically, we could talk about Gurukul, but more fundamentally, I thought we can talk about uh, how, what was the, how was education meant to be administered within the principles of Sanatan Dharma? And what can be done in today's world to, to manifest those principles? So, is there something? So, so basically, the issue comes up because many people now. I'm in America, and there are a lot of concerns about, say, the education becoming more and more not just secular. Secular is okay, but now it is almost becoming uh, a propaganda vehicle for left wing. So, people are seeking homeschooling. And now there are a lot of people are seeking homeschooling, especially religious people, Christians, Muslims, Hindus. But it's not easy for everyone. And of course, um, for those whom it's not possible, then there's always challenges. So, what do you? What was the broad? What is the probably the purpose of education? And what are the principles governing that? Would you like to start that? Yeah, in the Taitre Upanishad. You know, where it discusses about Vidya, you know, mm. where Shiksha only, there are three three sections, you know, Bragu only, Shiksha only, and Ananda only. And Shiksha only, it talks about education only. And in the conclusion of that learning, the Guru in his convocation address, what he says, what I've realized is, that Vidya is not synonymous to Gurukul alone. When education is separated from Gurukul, it becomes an isolation. You don't grow in life. When Gurukul is part of Vidya, then you actually grow in an integrated way. Therefore, in the conclusion of learning, the Guru tells the student, now learning has become a condition to you. And therefore you should go away from Gurukul so that the entire surrounding around you will keep teaching you, including the good teachers also. The teachers will also come along with you in your life. So learn from them. So when you're using the so word, that, sorry, when you're using the word Learning has become like a conditioning. You're talking of more something like a healthy habit. That healthy yes, habit learning. is cultivated by the environment of the Gurukul. Yes. And then once that habit is internalized, then you can go wherever and you will keep learning. Yeah, keep learning. Yeah. What do they say that the, the best thing you can learn is to learn to keep learning. Hmm? Yeah. The best learning is so, so that's that's interesting. So Gurukul, so when we when using the word Gurukul, does it refer to a specific format or does it refer to any environment that actually fosters the, that provides inspiration for learning and continuing learning? Yeah, any environment including a specific learning center. There was a Gurukul. There was Chhatrasala. There is Vityale. You know, there were many, see, the beauty of uh, the Dharma tradition, Sanatana Dharma, is that you can't define education only through Gurukul because other than few class like the highly aristocratic Kshatriyas and few Brahmanas went to Gurukul. Rest, everything would happen from the home front and few hours. Like even Lord Chaitanya did not stay in a Gurukul being a being a Brahmana boy also. He would go learn and then he would come back to them. Oh, okay. This is fascinating because yes. I always had this question. If we look at the epics, we don't see even Lord Ram really going to a Gurukul in the sense of going away from home and staying. He goes when Vishwamitra Muni calls, but that's not for learning. That's for serving over there. Hmm? And even the Pandavas, they were... 
I don't know whether were they staying at Drona's ashram or they were staying at home and going to Drona's ashram and coming back. Right. And they, again, I said, they said it was very flexible, very dynamic. Okay. So these no, three... There were Gurukul where you stayed also, but there were also education center where you went to the Guru's place or the Guru came to your place. Looks like the Pandavas, the Guru came to their place. That's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's three terms you mentioned. What is... Uh, Gurukul is basically, it seems more to be more like a residential school. Vidyala is more like a day school that we have nowadays. Yeah, see... Therefore, there is not clear historical evidence to prove, you know, Vidyala as per as I understand for a higher education where you study the higher knowledge. Gurukul, Chhatrashala, Patshala. Patshala is basically, it's not a full-time educational system. Not a full-time? Not a full-time educational system. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a very striking point that if we consider how diverse India was, there will naturally have been diversity in the principles of how in the in learning. the methods by which learning was administered. Yes. So, so you know, one of the concerns that increasingly comes up when we talk about Gurukul is that children they go away from their homes. So one is the lack of affection. Children do need their parents to parents' love and affection, and whether somebody else can provide that. Mm -hmm. So, how was this concern addressed when children are sent away? Now, in the West, yeah, so there is a system of like uh, in the West also there was uh, boarding schools, and now also have that. But generally, that is for older kids, and they become 13, 14. Basically, when they enter man, you could say, and it's more, mostly for males when they enter manhood. But it seems Gurukul was almost at the age of four or five. Sending kids away when they need their parents' uh, love and affection, attention. Uh, how did that actually work? So again, as I said, it is not meant for everyone. As a rule, went to Guru Dashram, and it was not necessarily at the age of five. You know, there is a flexibility. Some would go at the age of eight. Some would go at the age of eleven. Some would go at the age of six. But not every Brahmana's child went to Gurukul. Not every Kshatriya's child went to Gurukul. Staying with the Guru for many years. Right? There was a flexibility. Looking their Guru Bala, according to the astrological chart, if the Guru Bala is very strong, the Upana and Samskar would be done. And through that Upana and Samskar, the student would go to the teacher's house or the Guru's house. And one important principle was that Guru was never a sannyasi or a Brahmachari. The okay. Gurukul was always managed by Guru and Guru Patni. And therefore, when we read in the Bhagavatam and other places, you know that how a Brahmachari student should not be closely connected to Guru's wife also. Generally, we don't give much attention to that. But that gives a clear indication the Gurukul was run by the Rishis. So therefore, that affectionate part was received from the Guru's wife. And since the Guru was Grahastha himself, he knew the dynamics of a Grahastha man. Mm. One of the greatest tragedy happened when the Gurukul were run by First of all, untrained people, single men, you know, giving them false, dry vairagya, which turned into abuse. Right? Okay. Whether it is of sexual abuse or lack of affection, the traumatization is almost the same. Doesn't matter. Sorry, in what two cases? Traumatization is the same. I said whether whether you abuse the child, sexual abuse, or basically child not getting the affection from the teacher, just like what you received from the home. Okay. Yeah. So you say it's almost the, like a spectrum. The, when, the, when the negative side is abuse. Yeah. The positive side, even in the in the best situation, there is there is absence of affection. Yeah. Mm. 
so is this something which is a problem that almost you could say the the gurukul system in india is facing beyond specifically our movement also any organization which is a which is like a modern organization they have a trouble but the traditional gurukul run by the shankar mata madhva mata you know traditionally it is not run by a sanyasi never they may take one subject they may come and teach but it was always controlled managed run by the grassroots okay yeah so and if you could say so, that if the host, can you just maybe change your laptop position slightly because a face is going out okay so so the key here is not the so much the physical structure or the social the organizational structure the key is that the learning environment is learning and learning is to be fostered and that learning is fostered while the needs for affection and care of the child are maintained yes okay and how much is uh, and, yeah. and generally the children they are never trained to become sanyasis that is another vairagya was not vairagya or tyaga was not officially inculcated nishkama karma was inculcated knowing very well that they will go because if you study the 16 samskaras after the open end samskara the child if those who are going to gurukul they will take their meal from mother's hand and then they'll go to guru's place reside there and then collect the bhiksha because collecting bhiksha means they were connected to the society connected they lived the in a satvik vatavaran they lived in a satvik vatavaran but not necessarily in the forest okay so prove from a practical yeah. perspective what would be the difference between training for renunciation or training for nishkam karma yoga both involves some discipline some detach detachment so nishkam karma also is involves detachment De- detachment one one is where in the gurukul you are trained after the open and samskar the vidyaramba after vidyaramba then because the child start growing the guru realizes that he has gone through a lot of discipline now his age has come for or vivah samskar so the hair cutting will happen again no sankramana and then he would go to the parents place and there the parents would find a good girl for him and get married so the percentage of people who got married from gurukul was much larger it could go up to 90 95% and those who did not go back to grahastham that was very very small number yes so huh? but in one sense that the training itself was to prepare them for life as a householder yes and yeah. then yeah Because in that sense, is how the uh, samskaras are designed yeah okay if we consider in the bhagavatam we have daksha prajapati he wants his sons to to procreate and continue the dynasty but even then he asks them to go and perform some austerity so in one sense discipline yes. can be for various purposes that discipline can okay and all this is for boys what was there for girls or you want to talk talk that later we can go there later also if you want to continue yes so for the girls also again if you study i would prefer people who wants to study education in the 17th century you know the when the britishers came to india you know for the wrong reason they did the right thing which we can actually collect those info they wrote down you know they had a they had a you know the survey conducted from north to south east to west about schools which were running in india different kinds of schools and there they talk about who was there in the school you know the gurukul the chhatrasal the patshala what they were teaching so they prop- 
proper survey has been conducted and professor dharmapal has written five volumes book oh, so okay. even the girls had certain learning they would also go in a separate facility like if you read in the valmiki ramayana in the valmiki ramayana valmiki maharshi had a women's wing also hmm no it is valmiki ramayana there were there were women's wing yeah sadhvi so what they there. taught how Clear much they taught yeah Okay, but those sadhvis were students or teachers. They seem to be a little old, elderly, and they acted like mother figures for Sita, isn't it? So, the, so the, they were. They were also, you know, women were there. What age? Valmiki Maharshi does not specifically mention in Valmiki mm. Ramayana. So I would not get into, you know, kind of speculating. But if you come to the seventeenth century, then you'll find all over. all over india there were facilities for girls to may not be staying full time there but part time they would go and learn something related to you know refined aesthetics of uh, education some of the places like uh, ahilya bai holkar she had a army of 3000 women that means they must have learned the art of uh, fighting also yes i think in south india this kalari payat they have a special variation for women also in that uh, that particular martial arts martial fighting scene so so again it seems that everything was quite diverse mm. so if we consider even women like we have the example of gargi in the upanishads she was very learned so she, she learned scripture also it seems and there must have been some system by which even if we consider she is an exception mm, even if we say that but there must be some some way she must have learned it yeah otherwise otherwise from the if you study from jyotish shastra perspective hmm. what is the difference between girl and the boy from the chart perspective other than other than the distinction between a planet jupiter and venus for a man venus represents wife for a woman jupiter represents husband other than that when you actually see different planetary positions there could be a girl in her chart it may find that there is a more masculine energy mars and sun could be impacting so if you just make her her a housewife you know this whole concept of women never went to school they were only trained to cook in the kitchen you know and just take care of her husband you know that is one aspect of her life otherwise huge human potential the huge human potential of contributing to the society is taken away from them doesn't make any sense whether it is mother sita whether it is draupadi whether it is count kunti whether it is you know sumitra kaushalya you know kai kai where did kai kai learn the art of riding the chariot where she got that benediction how is that satya bhama she drove the chariot with krishna to kill narakasura dima how is that kunti quoting so many scriptures so it is not gargi and a few women their stories are spoken specifically but if you find hundreds of women you know again they were not see again we don't want to be liberal saying that oh, they did everything what the men did but they also learned significantly what was meant for them to learn hmm excellent, excellent so basically we could one way to put it is that they had they they learned that the domestic duties of a homemaker but that was not all that they were told to do apart from that yeah it is into that they had depending on their particular interests talents their responsibility they would learn other things also mm. so there is there is a of, vedic there is a there is a vedic mantra which actually you now many of the schools are using as their morning prayers the navesh talks about every varana you know let the let the brahmanas be educated let the kshatriyas be warriors 
let the shudras produce beautiful artwork let the vaishyas bring prosperity let the cows give limitless milk let our horses be very powerful and then that verse says let the women of our village be able and capable to protect and stop the attack from the outside forces this is the vedic mantra my god it's from the vedas not even from the puranas directly from the vedas mm. so you know it i've heard i've read somewhere among historians that you now what was there in the 19th 20th century in india was not just the reflection of what vedic culture was but often it was also uh, the effect of islamization of india because there was islamic rule so both for protection of women so this certain amount of restriction that came um, because if you consider british reports of india it does seem to say that uh, gender roles is a big subject i don't want to go into that right now we could have a separate podcast on that but it seems that maybe 1920s early early 20th century or late 19th century might not be the accurate reflection of what with what vedic culture or sanatan dharma role for women was is that reasonable to say very much because of that invasion because of the invaders coming and actually brutally attacking it is but natural and that actually happened more towards northern part of india no yeah because the invasion happened much stronger there hmm the concept of sati in south india it's a rare phenomena hmm yeah no you don't hardly hardly read about that very very rare yeah even in our scriptures if you consider there is no stigmatization of say widows we have Am- ambika and ambalika living on for a long time after their husband passes away that in the mahabharat yeah kaushalya sumitra and kaikai stayed they went to the cremation place mara ramayan explains also manu explains you know very clearly you know how up till what place a woman can go and it is a description of, after being there in the cremation ground where the head of the or you know deceased husband when it splits open then she has to come back she has to come back because they were able to defend themselves they had the resources they had the facility chanakya pandit 2500 years ago chaita artha shastra it talks about what kind of profession women could do what kind of work they could do what kind of salary structure they should have in a protected environment he provided the concept of making themselves sufficient with cultural foundation also. Mm. because it doesn't make sense only it doesn't make sense that just because they have a female body that you just focus them in the house in the kitchen in fact almost greater cooking was done by the men other than the household cooking all the big cooking the festival cooking the temple cooking you know the marriage cooking you will always find the men were working they would work together so what you are saying by this is that the ro- the roles were not so rigidly stratified at only this for men and this for women it was basically what was required like big cooking men would participate mm, or okay there was a distinction i am not saying that there is no distinct but the distinction was not gross it was not black and white yeah that's not so rigid that's what i said yeah 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 mm. so this leads to a question that you know this varana and ashram so did women have their own separate varana also and they would engage according to their varana means that some people say that well, the wife will just have the varana of the husband but every soul is coming by its own karma from the past the soul will get the varana from its past karma isn't it 
therefore therefore again it's a very pertinent question again open jyotish shastra now jyotish shastra is not it's one of the six angas of the vedas mm. right nirukta chandasu then uh, shiksha then yeah. uh, you know then one is jyotish shastra mm. so in the jyotish shastra every personality you open your chart you open your mother's chart her varna may not necessarily be the same as your varna one could be born in a brahman family but according to jyotish shastra he or she may have a different varna it's very interesting you know the varna in jyotish shastra deals with the internal psychology based upon your nakshatra i have seen some very highly educated brahmanas their varna is shudra varna or somebody is born in a shudra family having the varna of brahmana varna if you go by the jyotish shastra which is one of the, which is called as the eyes of the vedas mm so therefore they don't say that the jyotish shastra doesn't say that women's varna is synonymous to the varna of her husband varna of her father varna of her mother or her brother see jyotish shastra is so prominently so clear about defining varna at birth then how did the idea that the, the caste is determined by birth became so become so prominent in india narratives and then misuse you know wrong using there is again we are not see the coherency was so beautiful like generally the legacy now also in indian army the beauty of us that more than 70% of the indian army even the soldiers one may say are there is such a control even the soldiers with their lay down their life more than 70% come from a kshatriya family so they are able to maintain the blood they are able to to maintain that kind of disposition the spirit is also there and the disposition also is there by spirit and disposition how are you differentiating in the same thing spirit 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 is like you know because you carry forward the the inspiration of your father your brother your grandfather oh, okay 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 and the disposition means even psychologically you have the same yeah. tendency so spirit is more like belonging to the collective and disposition is more individual yeah okay so so uh, so how, so you are saying that uh, my, my question was that how did the varana by birth system spread so you give this as an example to illustrate that actually dynastically also it gets carried on yeah therefore therefore chanakya pandit for that matter you know explains how do you how do you find a good leader you know first he says find his blood genes then you find his good qualities therefore birth and character they are generally in integration but when the education system became disrupted the varna dharma with the invasion of outside forces you know focused more on birth rather than disposition and the spirit also oh but then uh, just to play the devil's advocate here the caste system seems to have been there even at the time of buddhism and jainism which was long before the major invasion started in india and these religions also said especially buddhism seem to Uh, one of the reasons it became popular was that it uh, it promised to free people from caste hierarchies so that time also or it was more the influence of kali yuga even before invaders came i would say it was there but see again if you see the society during lord buddha the society was not so organized in regards to centralized system in fact one of the first Large scale education, where centralized system was done by the Buddhist followers. A man-made religion always wants to expand to such an extent they want to centralize. But in the Sanatan Dharma, 
you will never find you will never find the brahmanas are can agree for centralization now there is no question of united brahmins coming together and attacking all the three varnas there is no such thing because an intelligent person you know the brahmanas are like the cat you never see the herd of cats okay so when shankaracharya formed his uh, his akhada as his mark was that in one sense to counter the influence of buddhism all all organization within hindu sanatan fold is either influenced by buddhistic or jain concept or christianity or islamic in the modern world you know either to counter or either by impressed by them otherwise it was always decentralized small educational system where a teacher knew every student and in turn the student would teach the junior students you know they never made it to a big big systems of running education books will not you don't have a library to find books you will find a brahmana's house where hundreds of books will be hmm therefore when uh, what is that name one uh, you know commander i think bhaktiar khilji when he burnt the library that was a centralized system created by the buddhist monastery so okay. that did not happen with the hindu scriptures hindu knowledge bank you go to any old brahmana's house in banaras go to kanchipuram go to shringeri then you will find you know everyone will have lots of literature with them hmm that's interesting you're putting it this way you know i i am in america i have been traveling through various parts so there are various native american tribes and there is some that were centralized uh, and they were just cut down by the colonizers very fast but those which didn't have a head those which didn't have like one leader and one headquarters they survived for much longer and most of the native That's americans true. who are there now still existing they are from those those tribes only which were not very centralized so so you are saying that as the centralization happened uh, the the idea of varna being determined by birth that also became more prominent thereafter yes became very prominent okay so going back to the topic of education two things we discuss is that gurukul is basically an environment that fosters learning and there is you could say customized learning for different classes based on their particular needs which could be determined by the varna so yes. now broadly what was the content of the education in how much was it uh, secular how much was it spiritual how much was it ethical how much was it technical in whatever i've learned whatever i've read you know the the education education system before the invasion of christianity islam and buddhism and jainism you know education was not necessarily founded with the intention of making you completely spiritual there were no such thing as a vaishnava guru there were no such thing as a smarta guru the gurukul were dealt with teaching of the vedas dharma shastra archery there cannot be a vaishnava archery archery is archery dhanur vidya is dhanur vidya you cannot put a tag on it as a vaishnava archery or a shakta archery it was not like that so therefore student from anywhere and everywhere you know, it's striking sorry oh. prabhupada also would say that the knowledge that we are giving it's it's not when a scientist develops some this make some discovery scientists don't say this is this is american science or this is british science this is science is science so yeah. prabhupada also harkens to those principles that it is that when it comes to knowledge of knowledge of operating in the world there is no sectarianism in that yeah mm. and therefore therefore in gurukul if you are a, if you are a, if you are practicing vishnu bhakti if somebody is practicing you know shaivaism they were given that specific space to practice that you know otherwise the nyaya shastra that again dharmapal talk- talks about the south india 
was more connected to vedas and their particular you know shaka the branch of the vedas nyaya shastra if you come to bengal in bengali area there was mahabharat there is ramayan there is the bhagavat along with other scriptures also you know so depending upon what is your background how much you could handle then slowly slowly as far as i understand the education system became more faith centric rather than knowledge centric like if so, you go to yeah. a christian just to, just to, if you go to sorry yeah yeah speak so they, yeah. see if you see uh, jiva goswami and madhusudan saraswati they both learn sanskrit they went from bengal to varanasi yes and now jiva goswami was not affected apparently but madhusudan saraswati became more of a advaitin after that so you would say this was the time of transition where the, it had already become faith centric or or means was jiva goswami is going to learn uh, in varanasi was it like a exceptional thing to do or was that is a normal thing to go to a, no that was the normal thing we to advaitin headquarters to learn yeah back and forth you know if you are now also it happens within the traditional guru where if i need to learn nyaya a madhvait will go and learn from them you know study from them the nyaya shastra or there is some madhva scholar who's teaching them uh, you know another subject matter other student will also come so now the teacher may have their own faith but the teacher does not teach that faith in the classroom yeah he would not do that yeah you know one thing has struck me over in the last 4 5 years that in material the material world if you have to function you need to be competent if somebody is say learning to become a pilot they have to be a good pilot you know whether they chant hari krishna or not in their personal life that's a different thing but if the the pilot education is is not really pilot education and it is education about devotion then that will create a hazard in society so in that sense separating so that there is areas of competence and excellence that's in india did have a vast there are many areas of competence you can say architecture music painting literature clearly people were competent so yes. you could say the environment was more so as compared to secular education today the environment was more favorable to spirituality but it was not meant yes. for spirituality yes absolutely they they had the foundational principle of maintaining in your maintaining your connection to god like even if you study greek philosophy you know like i'm i'm studying nowadays little you know greek philosophy before christianity you know i think i mentioned stoic philosophers yeah so it's like philosophy popular now in the west you know where it came from it was originally come from socrates only socrates mm. plato and on then there were actually a specifically categorized philosophers as the stoic philosophy i forgot the name of that person you know rather than giving his name he gave this concept of stoic so what he said he said he said very interestingly which which actually refers to some kind of connection to upanishadic understanding he said this entire creation is non different from god and because it is non different from god there is a law there is a logos there is a logic in this creation all the resources what we need it is already there and they said you need to have you need to have courage you need to have wisdom you need to have moderation and you need to have justice he said these are the four dispositions is required and very interestingly if you read the 12th chapter of bhagavad gita which we call as bhakti yoga you know the bhakti in the 12th chapter and bhakti what is defined in the rupa goswami is bhakti rasamrit siddho apparently they are so different from each other apparently but if you go deeper you will realize so oh, this is the progressive stage unless you have the 12th chapter of bhagavad gita as a a foundation if you you cannot come to what rupa goswami say 
No, then he'll use the Rub Goswami's teaching to basically for a wrong reason. Mm. The way Krishna explains Krishna, therefore, Krishna is the original Stoic philosopher. Beautifully put, yeah. So actually, in that in one sense, in the twelfth chapter, Krishna from when he talks about twelve, thirteen to twenty. He's focusing primarily more on like human behavior than devotional activity. Yes. How, how you function in the world. Yeah. And so, so that is not seen as outside of devotion. In fact, Krishna says this will please me. So the way you are connecting it is that even secular education or education that is not directly devotional can also be seen as devotional if its if its connection is understood. Even the Greek philosophers saw it. They said we are grateful for God. providing all these resources but we can't expect him to maintain us on a day to day basis just because we are faithful to him you have to put efforts you have to have a courage mm. you have to have a wisdom you have to learn the art of moderation moderation is nothing but again six chapter you know yoga yukta hara yukta vihara yukta chesta sukha karma so yukta sukha bodhasya yoga bhavati dukha right therefore krishna says You know, tasmas, uh, tasmas sarveshuka. What is that? Tasmad yogi bhavarjuna. At all conditions, you become yogi. Then, after that is established, then he says yogi nama pe sarvesh. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Tasmad sarveshuka leshu yogi upto bhavarjuna. Okay. So that yoga is not so much like a particular path of yoga being practiced. That is more learning to have the holistic connection with everything. Yeah, moderation, discipline, ahar, vihar. You know, therefore, mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody. The way uh, Patanjali described yoga and the way Krishna described yoga, Krishna's yoga is life centric. Patanjali's yoga is mukti centric. Beautiful, yeah. He could say even in the context, uh, Krishna wants Arjuna to fight a war. So that is yeah. what is required, also. Yeah. Hmm. You know, going back to this earlier separation, and Galileo was being persecuted by the church. He said that um, that the Bible tells us how to go to heaven. Science tells us how the heavens go. I mean, the how the heavens. Wow. Go. So he separated that at that time also. Yeah. And his point was that, but the biblical ideas. should not be used to interfere science with science so was there some uh, some kind of differentiation also like that within the vedic tradition that you know that secular no- that material knowledge can be acquired by material means and that we don't need that like spiritual knowledge has its jurisdiction and material knowledge has its jurisdiction mm-hmm. sorry Are you able to hear, Ru? Yeah. So I, I, that, yeah, you said. No, is there some? There was some also that kind of differentiation that there is material knowledge and there is spiritual knowledge and the two are different like that. Hmm. There, see how again, if you again, if you go back to the Greek philosopher, they were able to see, you know, God in creation, and therefore they did not depend on day-to-day basis. There was a gratitude. They were not materialistic. With the arrival of Christianity, all dependence on God, you know, faith, your loyalty became a virtue, rather than your purusharta becoming a virtue. Krishna focuses on purusharta as a virtue with the gratitude towards Vishnu. Hmm. So purusharta means by that you are saying human endeavor to. Oh, achieve things. Yeah, human endeavor for this whole disposition, courage, wisdom, and then uh, basically justice and mm-hmm. moderation. It's a human effort. You have to put that effort. And instead of that, purushartha is what is required, but loyalty. Okay. Yeah. So when so this is where when loyalty becomes the key parameter, then that's when education becomes more faith centered. Faith centric. Yeah, more faith centric, and then, then we we basically unconsciously start 
accepting the lower level of competency because you know still because they are faithful therefore it is better to be inefficient but faithful rather than efficient person without faith we created unfortunately that kind of conflict mm -hmm. an efficient person is not necessarily faithless according to bhagavad gita they are integrated faith is part of competency faith is part of dharma no need to separate the two yeah no need to create that conflict it's true not to criticize any particular profession but just because a say a devotee is a doctor does not necessarily mean that that that, that doctor will be the best doctor there's competency yes now, somebody can be a devotee and somebody can be a great doctor also but just their devotion yes. does not guarantee their medical competence yeah so mm. i would not i would not i should not be going to a doctor who is incompetent but happen to be a devotee hmm so what you're saying is if you consider competence and devotion the best is you could say the category where both are there but when devotion yes. is emphasized then then this becomes emphasized even if the quality is compromised and that can lead to problems yeah mm -hmm. okay so are yeah, you therefore there, therefore very very interesting therefore patrick nitze you know it's very fascinating Interesting concept. He said there are two kinds of morality. He said there is the herd morality and there is the hero morality. He said the hero morality is driven by responsibility, no? and the herd morality is driven by sentiments. Who said this? Patrick Nitze. Oh, <laughs> you no. are you are really a free thinker. Right? You can quote from. <laughs> and where does it come from? It comes from Plato. Plato also defined there are two kinds of morality: masculine morality and feminine morality. The feminine morality is basically forgiveness, kindness, magnanimity, creativity. But the masculine morality is the morality of justice. orderliness system and if you see krishna the character of krishna and the character of lord rama it's a beautiful harmony of the two krishna does not create a distinction between the two bhishma dev experience the the kindness morality krishna came to him and osko also the masculine morality krishna told arjuna shoot him mm. you know ram told ram kill ravan but then when vishnu was not ready to perform the last rites ram told him perform yeah. the last rites now don't don't hold it against yeah. him let his soul go on okay so you said herd morality is based on what exactly it is conformity herd morality is based upon sentiment because you like me and therefore you okay. and it specifically talks about how christianity promoted you know incompetency inefficiency and made leaders who were very ordinary made them the leader because they were loyal because they were loyal loyal to the loyal, faith okay so frederick nitze was not an atheist he was not with the christian systems i am not talking about christian philosophy the system is said will create ordinary people the system will create people who will control who are herd mentality yes you know when often we quote him saying that god is dead but what you know when he said god is dead he said this in a mood of great sorrow A negativity says yes. that when God yeah. has died, the whole universe is, has no center; it will collapse, and yes. what the future will bring, we don't know. So, in that sense, yeah, yeah, he was reacting more to the problems with institutionalized religion. Mm. Yeah. Therefore, therefore, the education you know makes. See now, what happened? Like I was talking to some educationalist. I said, the last thousand year, education has become very rigid. you have to learn vedas 
a brahmana born boy may not have interest in learning vedas so don't teach him vedas teach him some aspect of the puranic stories engage him according to his propensity the blood line has become less and less right mm-hmm. so you have to have a dynamics in regards to guru like like the the open school education system mm. right so what do they have you can choose not to take mathematics i i was hearing from some principal of a school she has started a system along with their uh, cbsc board they are also starting this open school where the children will choose five subject from the nine standard only if i don't want mathematics and i'm not good in maths so then i'll skip mathematics i'll skip science i will take arts i will take economics i will teach political science like the five subjects where you are focusing to grow Mm. you know in you know, that rigidity now, has yeah sir even now if you see the indian education system is much more rigid than the education system in america people yeah. have even the mainstream education system whatever be its other flaws it seems the rigidity in india is more than what is in uk also although uk system was brought to india so so you are saying that rigidity neglects the individuality whereas yeah in, because hmm Yeah. If I'm not interested in studying mathematics, but I'm interested in something else, then I should be given that. Right? Those those kind of so Gurukul had that dynamics. You don't want to come to the school, stay with the guru, no problem. Stay with your family, come to the guru ashram for three hours, go back. If you don't, if you didn't want to do that, you know you could come once in a while, study something, and go back. so there was such a dynamic for the child to become specialized in something mm. and then therefore therefore for you to find category you know all the documentation how many students studied how they studied is very difficult whatever documentation is there something was found by dharmapa what they used to study how many students were there what subject they were studying which season they were coming which season they were not coming okay so basically if we consider now that the content of education was more of equipping that student according to that their particular interests or abilities varana so that they can contribute in the world yeah and then and inspiring them in bhakti was that considered to be their family responsibility Or no was, therefore again because there was anti the sanskaras were there it was but natural for them to express their devotional in a private way it was not it was not it was accepted they will do this hari bhakti you know they will do it on their own but it was not like an imposition oh we will spend four hours teaching them devotion and just teach little subject of mathematics science politics whatever the focus was on teaching them what they need to learn to grow in life and the foundation of that was dharma right they would do their sandhya vandan they would go to their temple they would do it was natural it was it was we don't had to be preached about is swabhavik us pe aaja okay so it was a part of culture through samskaras yeah but that was not an agenda oh okay yeah so now in, in one sense we, you know and this brings us to a big question i don't know whether we can do it in today's podcast but so how do we translate those principles in today's world what can be done so the now, people, fortunately yeah. fortunately even in india i think wherever we talk we have to tell the schools also create a flexibility now parents are educated educated parents if you work with the parents if the child wants to come for two subject let them come for the two subject and the parents are going to manage other subject let us create the dynamic let the schools don't become rigid 
that you have to come and you have to study all the subjects. If the schools and the families work, then that flexibility will give rise for the children to study in a more meaningful way. Yes. Which I see most of the schools are not willing to be flexible. And, and therefore, when you start a new school, like when you start a new school, Gurukul, it becomes extremely difficult. If the existing school give that space for the parents, then I'll come yes. for this maths and science. You know, like in the uh, for the IIT preparation, you know, people don't go to school. Can you unmute yourself? Going through? Yeah. Okay. Somebody entered. I think. Yeah. This strange. Okay. So if that if that flexibility is there, then the synergy between the parent and the school will only increase the potential of the children. Okay. At least some of the people are willing to do that. Okay, so, so so basically at this stage, rather than focusing on the devotional aspect, we can focus more on the individual development aspect and that can be brought about through flexibility. Okay. And, uh, and do you see some positive trends in this direction that this seems to be happening? Greater flexibility, greater individuality? As greater... I said, the the parents are doing, but again, the homeschooling creates a lot of isolation. If the home and school, the hybrid model, like what was there in the Guru Kul, you know, where the student would go to Ganga Das's Guru Kul, like Lord Chaitanya event, and he came back to the parents. It doesn't talk about he went every day, you know, how much he went. There was a lot of flexibility. So if there are responsible parents, the school should allow the children to explore. Oh, we want to take one month our child to Himalayan excursion and we will also take. The school should allow that. Because ultimately school should not become a punishing, controlling system rather than a flexible system. What doesn't matter? They are giving their fees. They will appear for the examination. The parents want to explore with their children. You know, there is no harm in allowing to do that. The capable parents. Right? Mm. At least, at least the devo at least the you know devotee community schools or other spiritual organization, they also act like rigid only. We have to come. It doesn't matter how the child feels. Don't the child children require? So you, you are going out of your picture is going out of the yeah things, yeah, right? yeah. So, so some amount of disciplining is required, isn't it? Means rigidity. Rigidity is definitely a negative word, but how do you balance between rig being rigid and having discipline? Therefore, therefore, this we, can't leave, we can't leave everything just to the feelings of the children. They may not want to study. No, it's not. A, it's, it's it's not about the feeling. It's about the taste. It's about the disposition. Okay. Yeah, it's about the disposition. You know, if they are following certain rules, which are agreed upon by the school and the family, which is benefiting the child, then why not the school do that? Mm. You know, just discipline does not give rise to creativity and the growth of the child. That is so true. Yeah. So... And this also, this kind of dynamism or this kind of flexibility will also require decentralization, isn't it? Something centralized and yeah, that is more flexibility. And that is the foundation of Sanatan Dharma, the Gurukul system. You know, the Guru is telling now you go because learning has become your condition. Mm. 
why why should why should a system the government system just for the sake of controlling school and the student destroy the limitless human potential in the children so now maybe one last point so where did the funding come from you know since in america for example they have the they consider education to be like a fundamental right and at least school education is more or less free in the public schools people can go to private schools now many other country like india student, people have to pay for the education so what was the system because ultimately you may say that education should be given free but everything requires money infrastructure requires money so what was the system for funding of the education systems that... because because vidya dan was the greatest charity so therefore some of the landlords kings queens in the valmiki ramayana it is explained kaushalya mai being neglected by her husband was getting her own resources as a queen she would get and most of that she used for supporting the education system vidishthir maharaj supported 60000 students you know if if charitable people understand that there is no greater you know if you ask me very bluntly if i if i sponsor a dress for a dt or teaching education for a children it is better that you give your wealth for if there is a choice if you can do both that is good but if you have the choice between sponsoring an education to create a foundational principle in the heart of the child mm. right that will add value to the society otherwise if you don't pay for them if you don't take care of them somebody will will sponsor their wealth for their education and this very people will basically attack your temples attack your systems right so you yourself are becoming a responsible for attacking your spiritual system because you are not creating an integration so if there is a greatest charity if you want to do you know where a family sponsors a king sponsors the rich people sponsor education you know where integrated education then that kind of loyalty what it creates now this loyalty is not driven by sentiments but this loyalty is driven by knowledge it is driven by you know wisdom right but they will be the one who yeah you're talking about loyalty among the students or loyalty among the patrons the loyalty by the students towards the education system towards the people who sponsor them oh okay yeah yeah that is how it happens if i give you money repeatedly you will be loyal to me and then it depends on for what you give me the money yeah the yes, money has yes. really added value to my life and yeah, that's yeah. also yeah then how did it happen that say if we consider other religions jews buddhists even muslims spend a lot of educational infrastructure hindus seem to be very eager to donate for temples but not for education so uh, that is the greatest tragedy of one of the you know sanatan dharma greatest tragedy that you will sponsor for building a temple you will sponsor for building a goshala but you will not sponsor or running the goshala you will not sponsor for the running we we are hardly we have stopped giving remuneration to the educationalist so any idea why this happened you know, because uh, it seems to be such a critical missing factor uh, but any idea how, how it started or how it perpetuated because it seems so the ethos seems to in many areas going towards externals like yeah. while in the caste system also it seems focus yes. on the immediate characteristic that is the birth not the qualities so this yeah. whole external focus how did that start happening like one one scholar she told me you know she said is the increase in the number of dependent people like in a village there would be few kalakar there will be one sanyasi a bhikshu right 
that the society was supposed to maintain people and then the society would run what happened suddenly the number of people who are dependent on the society many organization came into picture they wanted infrastructure they wanted the system so the charity of people is focused on building the external reality rather than building the substance if you study the statistical behavior you know so if we again go back into providing you know the open and samskar was done for brahmana kshatriya and vaishya mm. now only it has become a social ritual among the brahmins mm. and 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 this gayatri which they would receive during open and samskar it is a samskar it is not a sadhana eventually if that sanskara would be carried forward by the child it would turn into sa- sadhana right he is giving his the child is receiving the charity the guru is receiving the charity and therefore he was able to run right there is a book called as annam bahu purvita so the scholars many collective scholars have come and worked on it he said he, he gives the example of he said all temples all dharma shalas had a facility for students to stay for them to get regular meal and there would be few teachers to study right it was very seamless and easily functional now instead of opening opening you know facility for the student every spiritual organization focuses on opening luxurious guest house no it has become more of a tourist center that rather than the learning center in one sense it almost is, even if there is some education it is more for it is not so much creating foundational education it is more of like you have retreats where where people who are already big they can learn but then they they yeah. that is not really changing society at a ground level so much mm. you find the potential children who are competent who have the talent you know and invest your wealth on educating them and see the difference what it can create whichever places whoever has done that whether it is yudhishthir maharaj did those 60000 students natakas they had such a loyalty for dharma they desired to stay poor in the forest with yudhishthir maharaj rather than staying with duryodhan this kind of dharmic commitment comes to the children they become courageous they become justice centric you know because they see that and because it is not happening then you have to you know depend upon wrong kinds of people to get for your education you know the rich people would sponsor big big cricket stadium they would give money to the you know sports stars and the film star but they would not want to give for education similarly some religious organization they will spend money on performing big big yagya spending crores of rupees but where are you finding the talented children and inspiring them and this is one of the greatest tragedy of india that we do not spend enough money for research and education america for whatever reason they invested lot of money in education every school or college will have a facility there is a scholarship there is a sponsorship there is many other things you know people you know can do that every community every village can and that's how it is to happen if every village can take okay we are going to sponsor 15 student from our village for higher education for better education the integrated dharmic education yet they are competent enough and with the character also yeah the one of the one of the prayer is a student is blessed by the teacher teacher bhava 
and vijaya vijaya is connected to their competency vinaya is connected to their character one gives rise to devotion and other gives rise to you know, efficiency like arjuna you know if if our society focuses on creating arjuna rather than karanas you know rather than helpless abhimanyus heroic but he had to lose his life but if we can create arjunas who are efficient who are ambitious at the same time who are devotional but we have to we have to invest our wealth in them so overall if you again just to look at the current trends i would say in the last 5 10 years uh there has been a significant uh, broad hindu sanatani awakening in terms of say people asserting their identity uh hindus are hindu temples are being hindu holy places are being made renovated and prominent do you see an educational ethos also being emphasized is that that also a part of the that, awakening that is happening the talks are happening there are some steps taken towards that direction but i would say compared to the emotional awakening you know, the kind of emotional awakening what has happened i've got about you know i am a hindu i am a sanatani mm. you know but there is no systematic training and education where okay i'll invest this much money for education and training you know so therefore what they said what we need is not only the school we want complete rehaul of the education whether it is parenting whether it is samskaras whether it is school whether it is you know learning of our shastras right so there is a facility because of the covid the online education system has given a dynamics to people to understand okay i can do this through online also i can increase my learning So that keeps on increasing, and it shows that there is a facility for increasing. Mm-hmm. So large number of people will learn the Vedas, will learn the Shastra, will learn the sciences. Right? I was talking to some student who was studying in the one of these colleges where uh, you know, like what the Bangalore Institute of uh, Indian Institute of Science, the Bangalore that famous college. I see. I see. In- I see. Like that, they opened six colleges like that. IIT Mumbai is also working on integrating the the Dharmic Knowledge Bank with the modern science. And this I see. You know, I was talking to one student. He is a Sanskrit scholar. He has studied uh, the the Ashtadhyayi. He still continuing. But that knowledge, that Sanskrit knowledge, is helping a professor. in regards to doing research on the herbs you know there is a sarpagandha herb which mm. was which was used by one modern scientist he got a nobel prize and shushruta it talks that this sarpagandha is meant for mental he was reading and because he is also having a science background you know the sanskrit the spiritual knowledge and competence in this is very overwhelming right there is a courage there is a wisdom and there is a competence which is not simply a sanskrit scholar but is connecting that sanskrit to scholarship which is research oriented is he a spiritualist very much he is also a spiritualist mm. that is the potential of the living entity full of knowledge full of bliss full of eternality rather than finding them full of knowledge full of bliss full of eternality many organization you know they don't want them to be educated because education gives you so much of courage that you start something very dynamic and revolutionary you know sometimes people want them to remain uneducated so that they remain loyal and uh, working class hmm so in one sense loyalty that comes as the fruit of education is better than yes. loyalty loyalty that comes because of the lack of education yes like bahunam janmante gyanavan maam prapadyate 
Yeah, after a person becomes Gyanaman, then Prapadyati, that is better in one sense. So yeah. same. Therefore, a radical loyalist will create a radical, you know, who will oppose it. Like those who are coming from the radical, you know, the, the very Wahhabi kind of uh, path, hmm. they are producing now ex-Wahhabis. And they are extremely good you know, so what happened? So that it will create some kind of some kind of violence. So if there is a learning loyalty over loyalty driven by sentiments, the loyalty driven by sentiment will be counterproductive eventually. Yes. So when you're giving, yeah, I just, so you know, there's one this American scholar Klaus Klostermer. He wrote a book on survey of Hinduism. Quite, he's a quite sympathetic scholar. So towards the end, he says that, that the Hindu 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 religious mind is dominated by images of gurus. But if Hinduism is sustain itself, what it will need is rational teachers who can present its principles in a way that is universal. The charismatic gurus will come and go, and they have an important role. But the future of Hinduism rise in this uh, rational young Hindus who learn Hindu the principles of Hinduism and teach them. So therefore, therefore, if you study, you know, in the foundational principle, Vedas Atato Brahma Jikyasa, Atato Dharma Jikyasa, Atato Artha Jikyasa. So there is a question mark. There is a hunger for learning. There is not conclusion of learning. There is a hunger for learning. Only in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, Patanjali Maharshi says, Atta Yoga Anushasana, which is a disciplined life. So, yoga is the foundation for disciplined life, and then there is a jigyasa. When that jigyasa happens, then the Guru Tattva becomes extremely significant rather than becoming a cultist connection. By significant means universally active or what do you mean by significant? Universally active. Universally active. Guru so you can you can see the wisdom that can help you to grow in your dharma and bhakti everywhere or wherever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. So, and just regarding so mainstream education, so now there are the if we want to have these principles applied, you could see there are broadly two channels. One is the alternative alternative system of education, which may be created, and the other is mainstream education is modified. So some of the examples yeah. you are giving of mainstream education being uh, integrating some principles that seems to be more easily possible in the STEM fields than in humanities. Humanities is much more. Uh, most were dominated by leftist agendas. So, yeah. what do you means alternative or mainstream or both? What do you recommend? Because wherever, wherever, whichever systems, trust, or people are having that passion, they are implementing already slowly, slowly. They're bringing those ideas also. As you said, STEM field, it's much easier because the the social science and the humanity. You know, there is a huge domination of left-wing left ideology. So you're saying change wherever it works, you just other than focusing on this? Wherever or... it works, whatever percentage, whatever percentage. Okay. You know, the culture is like a yogurt. You may have a ordinary milk, you may have a artificial milk, you may have a cow's milk, you may have a buffalo milk. But if you put that culture as any amount, it has the power to turn that into yogurt. Mm. So here you are comparing the yogurt to basically the these principles of education, wherever you apply them. Yeah, this yeah, wherever you apply. That's a very beautiful example, yogurt. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. So no school is an obstacle. Every school is we can provide something. Because you don't you don't have to oh, from tomorrow we take it over and make everybody spiritual. No need to. Wherever they are from, there you start little by little, little by little. 
if you have the resources start an alternative education system if you don't have the resources already have gone through half way add something one subject like how some of the engineering colleges they are using philosophy also now teaching philosophy yes i think at, uh... through ethics ethical philosophy is coming very much in mainstream research yeah because, yeah because ethics is becoming complicated issue mm -hmm. okay i think we can discuss more because a very complex subject yes so yes yeah. so shall i try to summarize yeah so broadly we discussed today about the very principles of education and then we started with talking about how the education was very decentralized there is not just a gurukul there is a patshala there was a vidyalay there was chatralay and there is many many things like that and the key principle was a learning environment and that learning environment would foster a ethos of learning which would continue even after that after this and that is what was the central aspect how exactly it was implemented that was varying you said that there is not much record of it but whatever record the british provided we see that there is wide variation then we talk about female education so that they also if we look at jyotisha they have their they have their varana and there are many examples of women being learned in many different fields and the point is that yes they, their homemaker is a important role but along with that they it's a waste of the potential to not to educate them for their other roles also now I mean, how female education was done, that could also vary, but the point was that it was not that they were restricted, and if the restrictions came in, they are probably in the later part because of invasions. Then we talked about the content of the education. It was the fo focus was more on competence, and the 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 devotion came as an addition. That was just through the overall culture it came, but the focus was on. competence and this led to uh, if otherwise if in the name of loyalty lower competence is tolerated or accepted then that can lead to negative effects and that's what happened in the western form of education you talked about greek philosophy stoic philosophy also how these two can be organically integrated and we see everything as connected with god and then the last part we talked about applying today so two th so one of the things would be we can have flexibility which can be incorporated and it can be done both through so if students individuality is understood more and then they are given facility to be educated accordingly then we also discussed about funding that support should be given more and more for this not just for external religious forms and then we talked about um, almost you could say universality in the sense that wherever it works like curd you can go through mainstream education system you can go through parallel education alternative education systems uh, always the principles in one sense can be applied everywhere they are like curd so many more points but this is just a quick summary thank you so much for, for your time see you yes thank you hey krishna